Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are grappling the subject of investor or trader psychology. This whole inner game of mindset mastery is crucial. We'll go through some practical examples of real trades and how mindset can influence the decision making there. We'll also give you some tips and tools to help you smooth things through and learn to rely on the process and not the emotion when it comes to decision making. Make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, please make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiel. Good to be here, AB. Thank you very much for having me. Now, topic of conversation today, a little different to normal. Most of the stuff we talk about, theory, numbers, practical steps, which we'll go on into today, no doubt. We're going to talk about the psychology of investing, though, mastering mm. your mindset. Look, mindset mastery, investor psychology, trading psychology, whatever label you want to put on it, I would argue is probably the single biggest distinction between success and failure in markets. And yet, as an educator and having spent you know, a couple of decades now teaching people, most people want to dive straight into analysis. How do I find good trades? What technical indicators do I use? What fundamentals do I need to know? What strategy should I apply? And all of those things are incredibly important. But if your mindset's not right, you're never going to discharge your duties as a trader correctly and you're going to end up blowing up. Totally. And we can use a lot of the same analogies when it comes to sport. For example, very Darwinian, same as trading by definition. And they say, you know, 80% of the game or 80% of trading is played above the shoulders. And mm -hmm. it, it is true based mm -hmm. on what we've seen. It's crucial. And I think why so many investors and traders sort of shudder to get involved with this is that there's nowhere really to hide. You're quite vulnerable when you start to go into why am I doing things this way? Um, you know, you can't blame it on a setting on an indicator or a data spike. It's down to you. And that self-examination is very, very confronting. So maybe sometimes it's easier just to park that in the drawer and, and come back to it another time often never to come back to it and never really fixing the, the, the damage link in the chain, if you will, between success and failure in markets. Self-reflection is hard, particularly when you've made a mistake and you've potentially lost money on an investment. With that, Abby, let's dive into some theory before we go into some real life examples mm. here, just so our listeners are aware of some of the biases that they're probably experiencing themselves likely at the moment or have. First one that comes to mind to me is the endowment effect. Mm. So the endowment effect is uh, a, a well-researched piece of psychological undertaking, and that is, or at least the theory behind it, is that when you own something, you treat it differently to something you don't own. There's a stake that you have in it because you've committed funds or a decision towards something. So you start to see the, the decision making around that sort of, if you like, sort of wrapped in cotton wool. Good example of this you know, is with your kids. Obviously, you don't have children at this point in time. I've, I've got plenty. And when you're watching them, um, you, know, you could be talking to them, oh, my kids would never do that because of your kids, you see them through a particular lens, yet they're actually doing the very thing you said they'd never do right behind you when yeah. you're talking to somebody. So you feel differently about it when it's yours. Uh, another silly example of this would be, um, you know, you might have a, a mug or a cup at the office that's where you get your morning tea. And if somebody else had the audacity to use that cup, even though it's in the cupboard for everybody to use, you get pretty cranky about Game it. Game on. All, all the cups are the same. The tea's going to taste the same, but you've got to a particular relationship and I know it's insane to talk about this but that, that, that's the reality of how we're programmed as human beings when something's ours we feel differently that can be a real problem in the trading space because once you're in a trade and you own that trade if you start to let those emotions overtake the objective signposts that you need to look at to make your decisions oh hold on to it I'm always good at picking this trade it'll come good very, very seldom works out. So you've got to be brutal, unemotional, and just have a very, very straightforward plan to follow to avoid um, that, that ability to let the endowment effect come in and, and really corrupt, I think, is the term your decision making. Got you. Don't get too attached, right? Mm. A couple of others I'd like to talk about over and under confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we've both experienced both of these, and I can say personally, I was probably overconfident when I was early on, mm. and then you experienced some pretty hard sell-offs through COVID and that kind of thing and was underconfident from there, mm. can really cloud your judgment. It, it brings again a, a, a level of, it, it, let's say you were tossing a coin and it was heads three times in a row. And, and I said, what do you reckon, heads or tails this time? And, and most people say, well, it's probably going to be heads again because it's in the trend, yet it's, it's actually a random 50-50. The odds haven't changed even though it's been heads three times in a row. It could be heads or tails 50-50 probability. And I think when you've had a good trade, or a good run in the market, you can sometimes bring that baggage of, look, I'm on, a, I'm on an absolute tear at the moment, so everything I touch turns to gold. Uh, and you can go in a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant, uh, a little bit more 
I've got this rather than letting the process take care of it. So you see, for example, in those scenarios where you're not really waiting for your entry criteria to set up, you're getting in before the B of the bang because you're seeing it big and you've got really good touch on the market uh, and that can be really devastating. You've got to rely on your process to uh, to to stop you from uh, from doing that sort of thing. So overconfidence is quite tricky. Underconfidence equally, um, you know, if you've been on the back of a, a bit of a, a bit of a slacking in the market, you know, you timidly dip a toe and I'm a huge advocate for scaling up or scaling down when you when you've had a good or a bad run. If, if you're not having the best of runs, stopping is is very difficult. To, to restart, but scaling down to smaller position sizes uh, and just keeping the wheels turning on a very, very small basis makes it a lot easier for you to start building that confidence again. Whereas if you've if you've come from being on the sidelines and, and trying to get up to speed with the game, it doesn't work. So underconfidence means that you, you, you might wait for too much confirmation for a trade gotcha. as opposed to getting in too early. This leads me on to two others, which are mm. probably similar, but slightly different. And that's negativity and positivity bias. So mm. say for example, you've bought CBA before and you've made some money on CBA, a lot of people automatically think that the next time you trade CBA, yeah. you can pick it because you've already had a positive experience. Works the other way too, but not necessarily the case. Very true. And I think as, as human beings, we often project our previous experiences onto a lot of scenarios. You know, we see people, for example, that uh, join in our trading community in our ecosystem that have been very, very successful in other business endeavors. And their expectation is that they're going to bring that level of success and expertise into trading. But if this is a new endeavor, you've got to start at the ground floor and build it up. You can't project that into it. And likewise, uh, on the opposite side too. Yeah. What about loss aversion? Losses loom larger than wins. Mm. That's a saying I heard plenty of times at uni when I mm. covered this, and one thing that I've seen happen a lot. Mm. Very true, uh, and I think there's there's a significantly bigger emotion attached to a loss than there is a bigger, a, a decent amount of emotion and pleasure attached to a win. So we always see, you know, the the, the losses are sort of right up 4K bright in focus, bright and coloured, and your winds are sort of grey and out of focus and fuzzy in the background. And again, it's a phenomenon of human beings. Uh, I guess it's our fight or flight mechanism that stems back from maybe when we're in caves. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we're very protective of our money. Uh, that reptilian part of the brain still works in that way to, to, to offer us protection uh, from a threat, and a loss would be seen as a threat. So, you know, that's something that does loom large when, you, when you're talking about it and can overshadow opportunity because, you know, they going hand in glove but if you see one bigger than the other then it's going to create inactivity and ultimately stop you trading indeed one that is probably the last one we'll talk mm. of as an example before we move on ab and that's fomo mm. um we've seen that a lot of lot recently of course with the market moving yeah. the way it has fear of missing out um you know you want to be on on the ride not watching people on the ride having a great time and 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 that can often lead to people buying into trends very late in the day uh, and and i think sometimes it's interesting and, and i get to this from time to time when i've done some one-on-one -on -one coaching or a, a rehab session with clients for example or prospective clients for that matter and and, and you go look the fear of missing out why didn't you get on when the signal was sort of triggered you've left it so late now that you're buying right in at the, the the sort of higher end of the trend there's a lot of fresh air underneath where you're at so it's a more risky trade and, and chances are if, if someone's been a little nervous or tentative because of maybe previous losses and they're bringing that negative bias into this this particular environment they've, they've held off for more and more proof that this is a real trend to hook onto. And in doing so, what they're effectively going to do by the time they do squeeze the trigger is get on it totally the wrong time and reinforce that trading is bad because they'll lose money again. So I think sometimes you've got to take a couple of steps back and ask, why is this FOMO creeping in? What stopped you taking the early signal? Where's your confidence at? And starting to break that apart and look at where the deficiencies are in the decision making process, whether that be the process itself is rubbish. Or, or in need of some work, let's not be too harsh, or, or whether their ability to follow it is rubbish, or should I say, in need of some work. And it's usually in one of those two areas. So if you've spent time building a really nice solid plan, um, you should have the confidence to follow it. If you, if you haven't built a plan and you have no discipline, that's a, that's a, that's a blank canvas you've got to start again. Oh yeah. So, I mean, with all of this, it sounds pretty confusing, right? Because we're diving into human biases and mm. emotions and whatnot, which you can't really measure on a spreadsheet or anything like mm. that. However, there are strategies that we know we can utilize to overcome these. The biggest that springs to mind for me is remaining objective and also having a plan. 
What are your thoughts? I, I agree 100%. You, you have to have a plan. It's as simple as that because any absence of a plan means there's no objectivity. You're going off feelings uh, and, and that's just a road that leads nowhere good. You know, you might get up in the morning having had a terrible night's sleep and maybe there was some bad news in the US and and that negativity is is now projected across everything you look at and all oh, this stupid market. And I guess one of the, the, the tools, and it's a very basic yet very powerful tool, and, and, and most basic tools are powerful, is that notion of journaling, whereby you're able to convey um, how your decision making is going uh, and articulating where the roadblocks are kind of real time or immediately after the trade. Uh, and for when you need some help from your coach, uh, when people come in and they've got notes in their journals, I'll have a look at it and it quite quickly, it can point you to where the challenge might be. So that, that whole feeling of having no objectivity and, and, uh, and, and not having a proper plan is, is a really major issue. Got to do the work first. Can I add to that as well? I think an important one for people is not agonizing over your positions. So for example, one thing I'd suggest to anyone, particularly people who I coach within our ecosystem, is have a dedicated time each day that's actually set aside to review your open mm -hmm. trades. The worst thing you can do is wake up in the morning, check your phone and go, oh, oh no. Have a time where you're in a controlled environment yep. so it's not emotional. That's exactly right. And you know, I've seen both ends of the spectrum where you've got people that are really don't really care uh, and are really hands off, which is probably not ideal. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you see someone that perhaps is their first trade and, and you go, have you got any, like, can I look at your record keeping on this? And yeah, they, they've got a print out of the chart <laughs> and they've got the pen all drawn on it. This is where I got in. These are my notes and it's, it's, it, it, which is all great stuff, but it's also almost overkill because they're checking on it like it's their firstborn where, you know, everything okay, can't hear them, you know, what's going on. Uh, and you don't need to do that. Once the trade is on, it's going to do what it's going to do. It doesn't need you to be super advising it and I think if you if you obsess over it you put it this way if you look hard enough you'll see anything oh yeah uh, and I think you've got to put a bit of air between you and the trade and just have a plan to follow so you mentioned prior before which I really liked was the notion of scaling up and scaling down now this is a way to be more objective so this is when we talk about record keeping and your ratios like your sharp ratio edge ratio win loss ratio average profit average loss and so forth how do you tabulate that to make an informed decision Look, you have to have good record keeping uh, and it's an area I think again that can become quite deficient for, for a lot of uh, wannabe um, self-directed traders and um, what I mean by that the, the actual final hard and fast record keeping is going to be done on your trading platform in terms of what the P&L looks like but that's only one measure uh, of tools and if you sort of take a bit of a look at and think about business for a moment you know with a business most people would say oh you know the only thing that matters is that you you make a profit at the end of the year and that's not strictly true because when you're running a business you've got to have a balance sheet you've got to know where your assets and liabilities sit you've got to have cash flow statements to know what the cash flow looks like within the business and if you're managing your assets correctly and you're managing your cash flow at the end of the year you'll probably make a profit but if you were just looking at the profit and you were unable to see what the working parts were behind it that can be a challenge so if we use that in a trading uh, scenario, your trading platform is going to have your P&L, but it's not going to have any of the attribution, the analysis as to how that profit was derived. And I think keeping a separate, uh, a separate series of records whereby you can look on a buy strategy basis, okay, this is how effective I've been at choosing my trades and the win-loss ratio might be a good example. That's not an ideal ratio, but nonetheless, it does add some value. And then once you've started to get a bit of an edge and you're finding good quality trades, it's now how do you actually manage the effectiveness of those trades to ensure that your profit is better than your losses when you get it wrong. So let's say you write seven out of 10 times and when you're right, you make 5%. But on those three out of 10 times when you're wrong, you lose 20%, you've got, you've got a negative strategy, even though you're picking more winners than losers, which would then point you down the pathway of, you need to look at your risk management because that's what's causing you the drama here. I like that, yeah. And so all of a sudden, just like a, a, an accountant would look at the cash flow within a business and be able to identify where you might have some choke points very quickly as a trader coach you can dive in and spot okay this is this is where the first challenge then sits so you know looking at things like that um i think to scale having an equity curve is is really important which is basically the pnl of your account i'd suggest if you use different strategies maybe some are geared and some aren't you, you have separate equity curves so let's say you're doing covered calls or cash on demand, that's in one equity curve. And then if you're doing something that's a little more aggressive, like spreads, for example, that's in a separate set of records. Why? Well, the, the return on a spread might be 30 or 40%, which is going to be you know 10 or 12x 
what you'd make on a covered core. So it's going to create a lot of volatility in that gotcha. equity curve. Smooth it up. Second to that, I like to put a moving average on that equity curve then. Uh, and then if the equity curve is above my moving average, then I'll scale up. And if it's trending the other way, that's where I'll scale down. And then what it does, it removes that, oh, it doesn't feel like my trading's going well, what should I do? You've actually got an objective set of measures to, to really nice. hit the gas or hit the brakes. Yeah. Now, one thing that we speak of a lot to our clients, which will add into strategies for overcoming this, is perspective. Mm. And there's really three areas within perspective, i.e. having the right goal to mm -hmm. begin with, doing critical reviews, and then shifting if you need to, which may even include stepping back from mm. your trading. What are your thoughts on those three key areas? Oh, absolutely, again, absolutely crucial. You've gendered up well for this. You've probably well prepared. This one. You know me. Um, wh when you look at the three steps, the uh, the obvious thing when you talk to anyone that's an investor is say, "What's your goal?" and they're going to say, "To make a profit, Andrew." It's as obvious as anything. But is it the right goal? And the answer to that is no. Uh, it's not the right initial goal. It's an important goal, but it's not the, the the major one. When you're starting out on this journey, and actually no, not when you're just starting out, but while you're on this journey always, the first goal is always gonna be consistency. And by that, it might be getting that win-loss ratio improved. It might be learning how to manage when to take profit or, or, or when to cut your losses, but being very consistent with that. And the idea of that consistency is that will then bleed across and enable you to grow in confidence. And it's only when you become confident in something that you're going to scale up and that's where you're going to make money. And it's a bit like learning to swim. You know, you don't jump in at the deep end and say, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the you know, gold medal butterfly swimmer. You've got to learn to swim first. You've got to get in the shallow end. You've got to see what it feels like to be in the water. You've got to see what it feels like to swallow water when you don't mean to. And then over time, as your confidence improves, you move down the pool to you at the deep end. And then that's where things really kick on. And trading, trading in that respect is key. So profit, yes, of course, it's an overarching goal. But the steps involved with getting there start with consistency and then confidence. And yep. If we look at the market as it stands right now, and not wishing to date this podcast, you know we are at all-time highs across you know everything from crypto to the major indices, and a lot of people have made some good money in that run up, and it's just been pure luck. And I hate to say that because they've opened a broking account, they've put money in, but it's been quite fortunate with their timing. And when this market gets a little bit choppier, if they haven't taken the time to build a process and, and, and learn how to be consistent and confident, that confidence will be decimated immediately because they're going to see their profit move. And, and that's not good. So that's one thing. Uh, the second part uh, you, you mentioned was that ability to to do reviews. And I think it's extremely important to, to look at your trades in the rear view mirror. Uh, and after they're completed, really go through and say, what were the essence of the positive elements of this? Or if there were negative elements, what in essence went wrong? Was it timing? Was it view? Uh, and they are different, even though they, you can say, look, I was right, it just didn't happen at the right time. You've got to be quite objective with these things. Was my entry signal wrong? Was my exit signal wrong? Did I miss a huge news point or a data series that, that clobbered it? And, and the idea from that then is that even if it's not been a good trade financially, it's been a good learning experience for you because you won't make that mistake, at least I hope you don't make that mistake again, second, third, fourth time. Gotcha. And so you're improving your system, but journaling is and, and doing a trade review is very important and it's again easy just to go oh that was another good trade and forget about it but the more you can learn about what made it a good trade the more you can do those kinds of trades and equally on the other side of the coin if you had an absolute shocker and made a, a mistake by acknowledging understanding what that mistake is you can eliminate it from your trading plan got you Last one on there before we move into some examples was shifting and taking a step back. Mm. Now, if I can share a personal example on this, I went through a really rough trot with my trading at one stage. Mm -hmm. And I remember my partner at the time said, Mitch, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Just take a week off. Mm. And I did. I didn't do any trades for a whole week. And I must say the mental clarity I had when I came back was so much better because mm. when you're in that stage, if you've had a couple of losing trades, you can really make some bad decisions. It can be, you could call it revenge trading almost when <laughs> something owes you some money or you've had a bad run. And, and that motivation is a very toxic motivation. Nothing good comes from toxic Never. motivation. Um, and, and so there's a lot of merit in, in giving a, a bit of a space or, or a breather in there. I've always taken the view that you know, if you come back and you want to be hungry to get back into something, that shows that you're in the right area of your life, whether that be, you know, let's say you had a sabbatical from training for a, I can't imagine you're not hitting the gym for a week, but, Never. you know, if you've had a week off, you'd be hungry to get back in there oh, yeah. and eager to get started. And that motivation is, it, it is very pure and it's very important. I think on the other side of the coin for other personality types, the notion of having time off, 
a week can suddenly become two weeks, which becomes a month, which becomes a quarter, which becomes a year, and then it's not something you do anymore. And so a, an alternate way of approaching that, again, down to personality type would be, it's not to stop entirely, is to, is to totally scale things right down. So the wheels are still turning, you're still in the process, but the financial implications of those processes, if it goes wrong, it's nothing. It's 50 bucks, 100 bucks, as opposed to you know, thousands of dollars. Uh, and if it works it, and you only made 30 or 40 dollars instead of three or four thousand dollars, it's going to give you a bit of a kick up the pants to get yourself back in the game. And I've used that that sort of handbrake, that chokehold. Um, a couple of times I had a, a client in the US a while ago, a very, very successful business person and was what he self-confessed sports trader. So for him, it's just significance just and recognition. It's like, if anyone makes a profit, I'll make more. If anyone makes a loss, I'll lose more. It's just it, the right. money didn't matter. Interesting. Very wealthy guy. Okay. And, and that was partly his, his personality makeup. So I scaled him right back. And when I say scale back, he'd go from doing an average position size of probably four or 500 grand on a trade to two thousand dollars, and he hated that would have it killed him because yeah. like, what's the point? Yeah. And the point is to get the discipline back so that you literally can ease back into this by getting so frustrated. I think you got to have eight wins at this level before I'll open the door up, and you can move your position size up a notch and a notch and a notch. And that's what we did to get him back, and got great consistency uh, and long term success for him. But at the time, the medicine didn't taste too good for him because you know, I'm missing out on making all this. And it's like, yeah, but you're also missing out on doing all of that. So we've got to backfill and get some good habit and behavior in here. So we're building a, a stronger and more firm foundation. Do you know, actually reminds me of an episode we did many years ago. It was called Walk, Crawl, Run. You might mm. remember that. I think it was August 2020 from Jesus. memory. Here we go. That's the mist of time. So we're, yeah, we're, we're a few years into this yeah. podcast series, it, that's for sure. Yeah, I do remember that one now. Um, it, so I was going to say, if you're a listener who maybe experiences much the same, go mm. and have a listen to that because we specifically talk about this in that mm. episode. Mm. There you go. And uh, I might go back and have a refresher on that. I remember, yeah. remember doing the podcast. I can't believe that's four years ago. That's yeah. crazy. I wonder if my voice had broken that many years ago <laughs> anyway. Okay, parking that to the side. So some practical examples. I was about to say something. <laughs> while. It's okay. Yeah, I know what you're about to say. Practical examples mm. as we finish up here. And I want to do two. So let's go through an example where you yourself have experienced some poor display mm. of trading psychology and then an example of good display because we're honest here. We want yeah. our clients to learn. Okay. And, 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 and these are in recent times. So this is okay. something oh, like nine years ago I made this blunder. And I think, you know, the idea of doing this is there's a lot of pressure when you're, a, when you're a coach or a mentor to people. You know, they can sometimes put you up on a pedestal. We're also human. And we, to the best of our endeavors, have acquired huge amounts of skill. But it's still possible to fall foul of some of these. And for me, if I look back, I've got a trade running at the moment in one of the portfolios on Vixie, which is the volatility index. Now, Vixie is interesting insofar as we've got a scenario right now, and again, without wishing to take this podcast, that we've got two wars going on, serious wars in different parts of the world. We've got interest rate slash inflation debates going on as to whether rates are going to get cut or not, and some of the inflation figures are firmer than was expected. And that, so that sort of ebb and flow of whether or not rates are likely to change soon is there. We've got election cycles in, I think, 66% of the world's population goes to the polling booth this year. Countries like India, South Africa, the UK, the US, of course, which is massive, uh, possibly here in Australia, we'll see. Um, and these are all factors that should create some China going into a yeah, possible recession, Japan in a recession, UK in a recession. So yeah, there's, there's some really significant events going on at the moment. Yet from a volatility perspective, nobody cares. So there's this enormous disconnect, and this was probably the biggest millstone around my trading last year between technicals, fundamentals, and what's actually going on. That no one's paying any attention to the fundamentals. And so with equity markets at all-time highs, volatility typically drops. So I'm in a trade there where volatility has just been literally like a, a leaf falling out of a tree, drifting lower and lower and lower. I mean, this trade could have, should have cut it ages ago. My view is that volatility is going to spike, which will give a great exit for that and, and we're able to go bank some profit and go home for cake and medals and put that one in the rearview mirror and do quite a deep dive on what went wrong with the exit on that. But that's an example of something I've held on to because my view is that vol will spike, which it will. 
So is this time. an endowment effect example, would you call it? I don't think it's an endowment effect. I think I've just become, I'm not going to say belligerent in my view on that. It just makes no sense based on 30 plus years of experience in markets why Vol will be dropping in the way that it is. That said, it is. And my view has been wrong and I've got to wait for it to become right. Earlier on, I gave myself a get out of jail card, which like sometimes, is it your view that's wrong or your timing? Well, my view's <laughs> right, but my timing's wrong. Let's play that card. So oh, yeah. here's an example. And I, I don't think, it's not an endowment effect. I, 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 I think it's just that disconnect that's in markets that's wrong footed me and, and and then I've I've not managed it in the way that I probably should. Fair enough. Appreciate the honesty. That's yeah. awesome. Let's go through a good example now as mm. we finish off on a high note. Uh, a good example, um I had a trade running on NAP. We, we we did some advertising about if you've got 30 grand sitting in the bank rather than you know four and a half percent, which would be negative after inflation, here's how you can get that money working. So we used NAB as the share as well as the bank account in the example. Uh, and and, and I, I, my goal at the start of that trade, I said, I want to keep this trade open. And it's in the advert. The advert was in, I think, May of last year. Uh, and so I think about 2 million people have seen it. So a lot of people have seen that. Ad. Holy smash. And a lot of people had a lot to say about the rubbish scam con and all the rest of it. And so I thought, I'll keep this trade running. I'll, I want to prove a point here, which is ideally not the best motivation for something. So I've been in the trade. Um, I've closed out of it. It closed what 15.9% for seven months. So I didn't stand it for a year. Nice. I got to 16, give or take, 0.1%, uh, if you can forgive me for that. Round up for that. Um, and I did it in seven months. Nice. And so it proved a point. Uh, throughout that time, we used protection, had the war in Gaza, uh, the status, we bought some protection, which took a little bit of the profit out of the trade by buying that protection, but it also enabled us to protect it. And, and, and for me, I was quite happy to see that trade closed out because the, I don't trade a lot of Australian equities, as you know. And the only reason I was in NAB was to corroborate that advert and prove a point. And again, I think from a, it's a positive and it's a profitable trade, which is fantastic, point proven. We know what we're doing and it was, it was a good strategy. But the motivation behind it was just literally that to, all right, let me show you how to do this. And I don't think that's a particularly good attribute to take into a trade. I'd much prefer it to have been um, a more, uh, I'll take the trade of its own volution rather than try and prove a point with it. And I think that would have changed some of the decision making I made in there. I probably would have kept it open longer if it was a trade I actually wanted to be in. But I hit the goal of what I had. Now, I just want this gone so I can refocus on my strategy having done what I've done. So it's easy to, I mean, that's a positive, but is it a great story? I don't know that it necessarily is because my motivation wasn't right. Yes, it's profitable, which then ties back to that whole thing. If you're looking at a company, you don't just look at the P&L. Yes, it was profitable. Brilliant. Well done. Company was profitable. Brilliant. But you've got to look at a little bit deeper behind that when you're doing your reviews to go, look, whilst it was profitable, it's probably not a great idea to keep doing that sort of thing. And, gotcha. and, and that's just as it is, you know, cards on the table, off the shoulder, no filter, they're real trades. And, and, and so it does show what a threat psychology and, and, and mindset can have all the way through this in terms of clouding your decision making. Indeed. And I can imagine your trading journals, too, would reflect much the same, probably in a lot more detail as well. Yeah, I, I think sometimes when you have a real soul search I, and I'll be I'll be really interested when I dive into that Vixi trade uh, and, and go through that. And that might be something that's actually merits its own sideshow in terms of a, a podcast, because I think when it's raw like this and it's, and it's it, it, hopefully this stuff is helpful for people because it's such a, it's such a lonely business. It's a very, it's, this trading is about solitude. It's you and it's you and your account. It's not you versus the market. It's you versus you. Indeed. But it's you and your account at the end of the day. And, and I guess having these kinds of conversations, which perhaps uh, ecosystem our listeners have also been through, will help them to realize they're not going mad. Why is this happening to me? These are all normal things for people that are in this space, whether they're a 30 plus year veteran like me or whether you're Joe Bag of Donuts that walked in the door yesterday. And being aware of them and working on, I guess, processes to remove yourself from the decision making and let the process do its thing is something that brings enormous peace of mind and ultimately, I think, enormous profit. Indeed. Process over emotion any day of the week. AB, cracking episode. I feel like our listeners will get a lot out of that. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks very much, Mitch. Anytime. There you go, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.